Madam Speaker, it is without pleasure that I rise today to speak on the Government's invocation of the Emergencies Act. Following my election as the Member of Parliament for Desnethe Mississippi Churchill River in 2019, we put signs throughout the riding with the slogan, Building Authentic Relationships. I realize this is probably not the catchiest slogan ever, but it demonstrates how my team and I have operated since. Speaker, through the pandemic, my team and I have consistently and strategically attempted to be a voice that brings calm and reason to a very tumultuous environment. Personally, I believe that is what leaders should do. The failure of the Prime Minister to show even a shred of grace or compassion for people who are clearly frustrated is frankly unbecoming. Some may ask why I start here. I start here because of what I have observed since entering federal politics just over three years ago where the Prime Minister and the federal government have shown absolutely no interest in building relationships with anyone other than those who vote for them. It is my belief the moment the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada became the Prime Minister, he no longer had the option of only representing Liberal voters. It became his job to represent all Canadians. But not only has this Prime Minister and his government shown no interest in representing all Canadians, they have time and time again shown disdain, contempt, and disrespect for Canadians who don't agree with them. Speaker, before I address my opinion on the government's use of the Emergencies Act, it is important that we consider what actions or inactions have led to us being here today. As confirmed by a Liberal colleague from Louis Hebert last week, during the last election campaign, the Liberals saw an opportunity to wedge, divide and stigmatize Canadians over vaccines and vaccine mandates. They did this to get re-elected, and they were successful. But at what cost? A poll taken just after the election showed that 77% of Canadians felt that the country was more fractured than ever. I'm fearful of what that number might be today. The politicization of vaccines and vaccine mandates by our Prime Minister has led to deep divisions in our communities, our provinces and across our country. By treating Canadians with impunity, the Prime Minister laid the foundation for what happened just outside these walls in Ottawa and across our great nation. He called Canadians racist, misogynists, and we've even heard Liberal members in this House this weekend call them terrorists. This is not acceptable, Madam Speaker. Might I add that this was before making any attempt whatsoever to meet or speak with them. In my past life experience, in any kind of conflict resolution mechanisms, there's always one thing in common. That's dialogue. They all require some sort of dialogue an active listening. Speaker, I was, I was raised to believe that respect begets respect. I am and will always be willing to meet with Canadians, especially my constituents, regardless of their political leanings. The only limit I impose on them is that they must be willing to be respectful and have what I call adult conversations. I believe that had the Prime Minister and his government operated in this manner, we would not be having this debate here tonight. In fact, I believe that not only would the protesters have left, they would likely have never come here in the first place. Unfortunately, because of the government's offensive rhetoric, several blocks surrounding Parliament Hill were indeed gridlocked and people had to forcefully be, me, be removed. I have consistently said that when individuals cross lines of acceptable and legal behaviour, they should be called out and individually held accountable for their actions. But you cannot paint everyone with the same brush, Madam Speaker. Let me share something I read from a blog last night. The writer explains that he lives in downtown Ottawa, absolutely in ground zero, he defines it as. The truckers are literally camped right out below my bedroom window, he said. He read a lot about what his new neighbours, he calls them, are supposed to be like, mostly from reporters. So what he did? He decided to go for a walk and find out who these people actually were. And now I quote, As I finally made my way back home after talking to dozens of truckers into the night, I realized I met someone from almost every province except Prince Edward Island. They all have a deep love for their country, they believe in it, they believe in Canadians. Last night I learned my new neighbours are not a monstrous, faceless, occupying mob. He concludes a long blog with this statement. What we should have never forgotten, we are not a country that makes an untouchable class out of our citizens. This brings me to the second part of my speech, Madam Speaker, 
and that is how I believe the current situation in Ottawa does not fit the requirements outlined in the Emergencies Act. During the introduction of the Emergencies Act in 1988, the Minister responsible, the Honourable Perrin Beattie, said this in his remarks. The legislation for second reading which I am proposing today will provide the necessary flexibility to respond to national crisis without invoking the War Measures Act. It applies only to national emergencies and distinguishes between four types. In broad terms, they are these. First, situations affecting public welfare and caused by an accident such as a massive chemical spill or by natural disasters such as earthquakes, floods or tornadoes that are of such magnitude as to exceed the capacity of the affected province to respond and to require special powers for an effective federal response. Second, public order disturbances that threaten the security of Canada and which are so serious as to be national emergencies. Third, international emergencies requiring Canada to take special measures in concert with our allies. Fourth, and finally, war itself. Speaker, the order in council released by the government authorizes the government to impose, and I quote, other temporary measures authorized under section 19 of the Emergencies Act that are yet known. The Prime Minister is essentially asking this House to hand him unlimited authority. We have seen this movie before. Remember March 2020, when the Liberals introduced an unprecedented bill to give itself unlimited powers to tax Canadians and spend public money without parliamentary approval for 21 months? Remember the documents from the Winnipeg Lab and how the Prime Minister's actions showed he has little or no respect for parliamentary oversight? And don't forget how the SNC-Lavalin scandal demonstrated that he has little respect for the independence of our justice system. More recently on Monday, when the Prime Minister announced he was invoking the Emergencies Act, he said the following, I want to be clear, the scope of these measures will be time limited, geographically targeted, as well as reasonable and proportionate to the threats they are meant to address. Since then, Madam Speaker, the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister has stated that she is looking to make some of these provisions permanent. The Justice Minister admitted that the Liberals were looking to use the Act to punish political opponents. And the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice said the Emergencies Act provisions technically apply to all of Canada. Speaker, I ask, why should Canadians trust this Prime Minister now and grant this open-ended request to limit the civil liberties of all Canadians? Speaker, today I join with the Premiers of Quebec, Alberta, Manitoba, Prince Edward Island and Premier Scott Moe from my province of Saskatchewan along with many legal experts, civil liberties associations, and millions of regular Canadians across this country saying that while the situation here in Ottawa has been very difficult for many people, and I have a great amount of compassion for them, it did not meet the standard of a national emergency. Thankfully, Madam Speaker, there was, there was no widespread violence and no loss of life. Speaker, the Prime Minister said in his remarks at the opening of this debate, this situation could not be dealt with under any other law in Canada. I do not believe this to be true, and for the Prime Minister to say this in the House of Commons leads to the degradation of our democratic systems and erodes the already low level of trust in government. The precedent that this sets is leaving many people in my riding with grave concerns for the future of our country. Speaker, far be it for me to quote an NDP MP, but tonight I'm going to because the Honourable Tommy Douglas was from Saskatchewan. In describing Pierre Elliott Trudeau's use of the War Measures Act during the October crisis, he said it was like using a sledgehammer to crack a peanut. Now, Speaker, I'm sure that my colleagues from all parties would agree that what happened outside these walls pales in comparison to what took place in 1970. So I implore my NDP colleagues to consider their roots. Consider what the great Tommy Douglas would do if he were here in this House at this moment in time. In closing, Madam Speaker, there's no easy way to put this. The division that has resulted from this pandemic has been heartbreaking. I've seen it divide our country, provinces, communities, workplaces, social clubs, churches, friendships, and even our families. I'm afraid that the Prime Minister's use of these heavy-handed measures will only further divide our country. Thus, Madam Speaker, I'm asking all members in this House to search very long and very hard when they decide how they're going to vote on this motion tomorrow night. Let's work together to start healing the brokenness that is so evident across this great country. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my friend opposite, whom 
I have a great deal of respect for, and I've worked uh, with him at the Indigenous Affairs Committee. Um, and I do want to, uh, at the outset, say that I believe Canadians are united. I believe over 90% of Canadians have been vaccinated, uh, and, and many more are continuing to be vaccinated as we speak on the second and, and the booster doses. Uh, but what I do want to ask my friend opposite is that we've seen a lot of hate outside over the last several weeks. Um, I personally um, have, it, have found it very difficult to go and engage. Um, and it's pretty obvious why, because I'm, I'm a racialized individual. I have seen symbols of hate that, that profoundly um, affects me. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering what his thoughts are about the, the calls to engage uh, with these uh, blockaders and, and, and what he thinks um, uh, that kind of engagement would have resulted in. The Honourable Member for Desnete, Mr. Nipi Churchill River. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I, I want to thank my Honourable Colleague for the question. We have worked together on the I-9 Committee and, and have a mutual respect. What I, what I would say is both I and every Conservative, Conservative, every single Conservative colleague would say is that we are 100 percent against any supremacy, white supremacy, any bigotry, any kind of racism. The member knows very well, and he knows my record on the INAN Committee. If he looked at the work I've done advocating for First Nation people and for Métis people in my riding, for Indigenous people across this country, he knows that to be true. If he looked at the work I've done coaching minor hockey in my, in my riding, coaching kids from across the riding, from First Nations and Métis communities, he knows the work I've done, he knows my record, I'm happy to stand on that record. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to ask my colleague what he thinks of the fact that when it was announced that the convoy was coming, we knew that there were extremists among those people. And, but they just let them get set up and dig in. And then once that happened, it seems to me that the Prime Minister should have taken more initiative to ensure that there was a coordination of the different police forces, but nothing was done. So what does my colleague think of that? Honourable Member for Desnete, Mr. Nippy Churchill River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank, thank my colleague from the block for the great question. Um, like I said in my comments, the first step to resolving this was to actually listen to people, to have dialogue with people. That's the, the root of any conflict resolution mechanisms. It was known for weeks that these people were coming to Ottawa, but yet nobody went and talked to them. The Prime Minister claimed in his comments that he has supported and met with all levels of government and all people involved in this, that he was very in tune with what was going on. But yet they did nothing. They did nothing until they bring out the Emergencies Act. I'll go back to my sledgehammer and a peanut argument. We went from zero to 100 overnight, and this was never necessary as initial steps to dialogue and hear the concerns of these very frankly frustrated people would have gone a long way to resolving this issue a long time ago. We have time for a brief question. The Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would uh, say through you to the member that the world has changed a lot from the 1970s. And unfortunately, we are dealing with much larger manifestations of hate. And I thank the member for denouncing, and, uh, and, and I think that is a consensus point in this House during this uh, few past few days. But I wanted to ask, how do we, I want to ask the member through you, Madam Chair, how do we as parliamentarians deal with the reality going forward of this hate and division in our communities? Remember, there's nothing missing Nippy Churchill River has one minute to respond. A whole minute, Madam Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> um, Madam Speaker, I want to thank the, the, my, my colleague from the NDP for the question. And I, I would go back to my initial comments that I made in my speech and the work that my team and I have done in our riding. And, and, and we talk, and, and you know it's a slogan, and everybody, oh, it's just a slogan. But building authentic relationships with people, it actually works, Madam Speaker. It actually works. And so we have to become active listeners. We have to engage people at the appropriate level. And we have to dialogue with people. We have to get to the place where we can have what I call adult conversations with people, even though we might not agree with their philosophy. Maybe we don't agree with their ideology, but if we have adult conversations, respectful conversations, sometimes it's appropriate for us to agree to disagree, but we can do that respectfully. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for